Saint Joan. Who is she? She was Joan of Arc. How did she become Saint Joan? We will come to know today. Hello, how are you? This is Hina from Team Walad. Today's capsule summary is Saint Joan. It is a play which was premiered in 1923 in New York. Playwright, the person who has written it, is of course our dear George Bernard Shaw, an Irish playwright who lived till 94 years, lived from 1856 to 1950. And let me tell you, shortly after the publication of St. Joan, Shaw received the Nobel Prize for Literature. Genre of St. Joan is, it is a historical drama along with being a social, you know, criticism play, you know, filled with social criticism. Setting is France in the 15th century. Many terms today will be related to France. They will be French. And in a you know nutshell, Saint Joan is a chronicle play in six scenes and an epilogue. So there are no acts. Six scenes will be there, and at the end of the play, there will be an epilogue, and it revolves around 15th century French military figure Joan of Arc. Okay, now who was Joan of Arc? Joan, she's a teenage, uneducated peasant girl usually referred to as the maid by others. So Joan is called as the maid. She is based on Joan of Arc from Lorraine, France, a true historical figure. She claims that she has a direct communication with God. Okay. So Joan is this very strong, very strong military figure, military personality who has fought many battles for the French. Okay. And she says that during this you know, battle time or decision-making time, she has a communication with God. How? Through saints. Which saints? Saint Margaret, Saint Catherine, and the Archangel Michael. Okay, now we will start with the play. As I told you, six scenes. Let's start with scene number one. Setting is in February 1429. Just remember, don't remember the dates, it's okay. So setting is February 1429 at the castle of Wokulo, Wokulo, like now, how do French pronounce it? We'll call it Wokulo. Robert de Baudricourt is a nobleman or a squire who hails from Lorraine, just like Joan. Okay, so they know each other because they both belong to that place. At the start of the play, this Captain Robert, whom I'm calling Baudricourt, he complains to his steward or manager that the hens have stopped producing eggs at his castle. And after this, he agrees to meet Joan, who has been waiting outside for two days. But Baudry Court is not ready to give her time, okay? After two days, he agrees that, okay, today I will meet Joan. Joan enters and tells Baudry Court about her visions and voices guiding her to free France from England's invasion. Here, a very important theme is the Hundred Years' War. What were they? They were a series of wars. The Hundred Years' War during the Middle Ages were a series of territorial conflicts between France and England between 1337 and 1453, okay? Now, the meeting is happening between Baudricourt and Joan. Joan is this poor peasant girl. Baudricourt is this rich, you know, noble man or a squire. Baudricourt thinks that Joan has become crazy. She's claiming to have direct communication with God. She does not need any church. She does not need any clergyman. But his steward, Baudricourt's steward, believes in Joan and cajoles his master to help her. So what is the plan Joan has brought to Baudricourt? The plan of Joan is she wishes to lift the siege of Orleans. Orleans has been captured by the English people. So she wants to free Orleans city from England oppression. And for this purpose, she requests from Baudricourt what all? An armor, a horse and soldiers. Okay. Now Joan says, not just this, this is not just, not the only plan. Her further plan is she wants to coronate or help in the coronation of Dufour of France. Of France. Now, who is a Dufour? Dufour was a title given to the heir to the throne of France. So this Dufour right now is not sitting on the throne, but he's the rightful heir to the throne of France. Okay. So reluctant at first, Baudricourt agrees to help Joan. 
With Baudricourt's help, Joan can now meet the Dufour at Chinon. Chinon is like a commune or, you know, you can say it's like an area in France. She is dressed in men's clothing and is accompanied by two soldiers, Bertrand de Polengue and Monsieur John of Metz. Difficult names, please remember them. She is accompanied by two soldiers, Polengue and Monsieur John of Metz. Let's listen about Polengue. Polengue calls Joan a miracle. He believes in her military strategy from the start. And Joan calls this Polengue as Polly. That's how they refer to each other. Polengue justifies being with Joan with these lines. We want a few mad people now. See where the sane ones have landed us. Okay, the sane ones, the people who are not fighting correctly. They have brought France to this such despicable state. Mad people like Joan are required to free France. Okay, Joan leaves. The steward enters and informs Baudricourt that the hens have begun to lay eggs again. Baudricourt is surprised. He interprets this as a sign from God to believe in Joan and her divine inspiration. The theme is divine inspiration. With this, we are done with scene one of St. Joan. Let's start with scene two. This is from March 1429. Okay. Setting is Dufon's castle in Chinon, Touraine province, meeting between Dufon and Joan. You know, Dufon is going to be the king of France. Joan is this peasant girl ready to fight for France. Let's listen to their meeting. The Dufon is the 26th year old heir to the French throne. He is the illegitimate son of the king and therefore members of the court actually do not respect him. Quote, a poor creature physically, Dufon dresses badly and is also indifferent to political and military matters. He hardly cares. He likes to sit comfortably in the castle, in the palace, and just chill maro. <laughs> it is Joan who, with her strong oratory skills and leadership, convinces the weak Dufon to act like a true French man and rally his troops to drive out the English occupiers and restore France to greatness. Having nothing to lose, Dufon lets her command his army. So now Dufon's army, but who will command it? Joan. Okay, with this scene two out of scene six is done. Let's start with scene three of St. Joan. The timing of this is April 1429. The months are changing. You can see the year is the same, 1429. Setting is River Loe, Loire, okay, River, River Loire in Orleans. Joan and her army reach River Loire, where she meets Jean Comte de Dunois, bastard of Orleans. Please just remember this character as Dunois, Dunois, okay? So just understand. Joan has now reached this river from where they're going to attack English, okay? They're going to take back Orleans from this area, River Loire. And here she meets Dunois. Who is Dunois? Dunois is a 26-year-old, very efficient, very strong French military leader. He respects Joan's military skills and recognizes that her leadership has resulted in many French victories. Dunois tells Joan that they can't attack the English until the west wind is in their favor. But Joan is desperate to fight. She wants to fight the Englishman and free Orleans as soon as possible. Desperate to fight, Joan prays with Dunois. And can you imagine? Miraculously, the west wind changes its course. It comes in the favor of the French. Yes. Dunois feels that this is evidence enough from God that Joan indeed is God sent. And just like this, they prepare to fight the English. I want to bring in some, you know, lines from the play. During this time when they are waiting to attack the English, Joan and Dunois talk to each other about their mutual love of war. Listen to the lines. Dunois says, I, God forgive me, I'm a little in love with war myself, the ugly devil. I am like a man with two wives. Do you want to be like a woman with two husbands? He's literally calling war as his wife, okay? Listen to what Joan answers. I will never take a husband. I am a soldier. I do not want to be thought of as a woman. 
I will not dress as a woman. I do not care for the things women care for. They dream of lovers and money. I dream of leading a charge and, a, and of placing the big guns. Joan, war time, scary time. How, you know, I feel we are literally, you know, uh, doing this hero worship. But imagine the time of war when people die needlessly. It is so difficult. It is so difficult for families. I can say this right now because currently in the world, as you can see, wars are waging. And we can see the death toll, the number of people dying. It is very, very distressing. Okay, it is very sad. Let's return to the novel. Scene three is done. Let's start with scene four. Again, the month is changing. Year is the same. So June month, year 1429. Setting is English side of the camp. Okay. Until now, we were talking about French people. Joan was French. Dunois was French. Of course, everyone was French. Now we're talking about English. The enemies of French. Richard de Beauchamp. Okay. Beauchamp, Earl of Warwick. We will call him Warwick. Is a noble man and in charge of English forces. He's the first important villainous character, Warwick. Second, John Boyer Spencer Neville the Stagumber is Warwick's chaplain or member of the clergy. I will call him as Stagumber Chaplain. Stagumber Chaplain. He's the second villainous character. Third, Peter or Pierre Pouchon, Bishop of Beauvais. Pouchon is a French churchman from Burgundy region and Burgundy were the allies of English. So these three men are discussing Joan and the threat she has posed to their authority. Okay, here the theme is individual versus institution. Joan is acting as a very strong individual. Okay, whereas these people lead an institution. Warwick belo belongs to that feudal system. Stagumber and Kushaw, they all belong to the church. Okay, so they belong to institutions. Remember their names again, villainous characters. Warwick, Stagumber Chaplin, and Pouchon. Easy, they are discussing Joan. Let's move on. Warwick is scared that under Joan's proposed social order, noblemen like him would lose their land because the entire power would be endowed to one king who in turn would answer only to God. Warwick is scared because Joan is proposing that king will be one almighty, there will not be small, small feudal lords. All the power will vest in one king who will directly communicate with God. So she's removing the feudal lords. She's removing the church. So she she's getting a lot of enemies like this. So Warwick is scared, okay? Second, Chaplin. Chaplin hates Joan excessively and he considers her a witch who must be killed. So Chaplin considered Joan to be a witch. And third, Houchon feels that Joan's direct communication with God threatens the church's institutional power. Of course, church will lose its power, no, if there will be a direct connection between a person and God. So these three men in the play want Joan to be stopped from her quest as soon as possible. Theme, institutions and corruption of power. Listen to lines from the play, what Couchon tells to Stagumber Chaplin for Joan, quote, she acts as if she herself were the church. She brings the message of God to Charles and the church must stand aside. She will crown him in the cathedral of Reims. She, not the church. She sends letters to the king of England, giving him God's command through her to return to his island on pain of God's vengeance, which she will execute. Has she ever in all her utterances said one word of the church? Never. It is always God and herself. Understood? These people, they hate Joan. With this, let's enter scene five from St. Joan. Month is July. Year is same, 1429. Setting is Cathedral at Reims. This is a city in France, okay? After the successful siege of Orleans and many other military victories, Joan finally crowns Dauphin as the king of France. He's called as King Charles VII. So after coronation, Dauphin became King Charles VII after his father. Easy. So who crowns him? It is Joan. But she feels that nobody literally respects her in the court. Nobody is praising her. She's confused. She even talks to Dunois about it. That why is nobody 
you know, considering me to be powerful? Is it because I'm a girl? You know, like that. Whatever. Now, after this, it is time for Joan to return home. You know, where her plan has been executed well, but how you want more, more, more. She suddenly exclaims to Dunois, quote, before I go home, let's take Paris. Understood? Which means, now let's take Paris from Englishmen. Everybody, including the king, King Charles VII and Dunois, feel that they should not go too far in their way with the English. So the crown, the military and the church, everybody warns Joan that if her enemies ever capture her, she will be on her own. Nobody from French area or from, you know, church, military and all these French famous important people, nobody will come to rescue her. And Joan is dejected. She feels alone. Realizing that she is alone on earth, Joan declares that she will fight for her people and for God. With this, she crashes outside the court, leaving the men bewildered and scared. Here the theme is excessive pride. Who showed it here? Joan. With this, the last scene of the play starts. Scene six, the year changes here. The year goes to 1431. Month is May. Setting is Joan's execution. She will die soon. Listen. Joan has been captured by the English and is on trial for heresy. Heresy is when, you know, you work against the institution. You work against the church. So she's on trial. Stagumper, the chaplain, is adamant that Joan should be executed at once. But brother Joan Lemaitre, who is the inquisitor, then the bishop of Beauvais, who is Couchon, we know him, and the other church officials on both sides of the trial, you know, with Joan, against Joan. They all discuss the length of the nature. You know, they all discuss at length about the nature of Joan's heresy, which means they give time, you know, to Joan to repent, to recant. To say that, you know, whatever I was telling till now that I can directly communicate with God, that I'm all powerful, it is all wrong, I was lying. They give her time to repent, but she does not. Joan refuses to change her decision. She says that she indeed hears voices from God. She indeed feels that the angels come to visit her. But when she learns that, you know, if she would sign a document, she would be saved from the punishment. So in a rush, she agrees to sign the document. But after signing the document, she comes to know that her death sentence is removed. Her life imprisonment, she will be in jail for life, stays. And hearing this, she gets angry. She's like, I cannot be behind bars for life. That is as good as death for me. So she tears the documents and exclaims, listen to her lines. You think that life is nothing but not being dead? It is not the bread and water I fear. I can live on bread. But to shut me from the light of the sky and the sight of the fields and flowers, to make me breathe foul, damp darkness, without these things, I cannot live. And by your wanting to take them away from me or from any human creature, I know that your counsel is of the devil. She is criticizing the people who are against her you know, who are giving her life imprisonment. So she's saying, I will not take life imprisonment. You can, you can burn me. Okay. She's burnt. Her execution is through burning. Joan's decision to recant, you know, in the play, G.B. Shaw says that when she had decided to recant, G.B. Shaw says, nothing could be more sane or practical. But how, you know, her redecision to reject her recantation demonstrates another act of reasoning. So she weighs the pros and cons of the two options. And she prefers dying rather than spending the rest of her days rotting in jail. Here the theme is madness versus sanity. Did she act mad or did she act sane? Tell me, by accepting death and not life imprisonment. Following this, the Joan of Arc is burnt at stake, except for her heart. The executioner who burnt her revealed that her heart could not be destroyed. Stagumber, the chaplain who wanted her execution very, very fast, very, very fast, when sees her burning, he gets mad. He feels grave pain looking at the actual burning. He informs Warwick and Couchon that an English soldier... He offered Joan a cross, a makeshift cross, before her burning. 
In fact, one more man offered her a cross. He was Brother Martin Ladvenu. Brother Martin Ladvenu, a young Dominican priest, also approaches Joan to give her a cross. But when the flames increase, Joan orders Ladvenu to back away and protect himself. This act of selflessness makes Ladvenu believe that Joan was inspired not by the devil, but by God throughout her life. With six scenes done in St. Joan, we end the play with an epilogue. Epilogue happens 25 years after Joan's execution. The king is still the same, King Charles II. He has, has, you know, he has achieved some success during these years. Brother Martin Ladvenu, okay, the same person who tried to give the cross to uh, Joan when she was burning, he comes to give the good news to King Charles VII. What good news? The charges of heresy against Joan have been dropped at a retrial after 25 years of her dying. The following night, Joan appears to Charles VII in a dream. So, you know, a dream begins. Let's listen about this dream that King Charles has in which Joan is standing in his room. King Charles gives the good news of her innocence to Joan. One by one, all of Joan's enemies also appear in the room. Even the English soldier who offered a cross, remember an English soldier who offered a cross to Joan appears? This English soldier has been given a day off from hell on the anniversary of Joan's death. All this is happening in dream, huh? King Charles' dream. Then a gentleman in 1920s clothing appears and informs these people in the room that the church has canonized Joan 500 years after her execution. Of course, it'll be 500 years, right? 1920s. Everyone apologizes to Joan. And after this, Joan asks them whether she should come back to life and join them. To this, the men become quiet. Till apologizing, it was fine. Do they want Joan to return to life? They leave the room one by one, implying that the world is not prepared to receive a saint such as Joan. To this, Joan cries, despairing mankind. She says, O oh God, that madest this beautiful earth, when will it be ready to receive thy saints? How long, O oh Lord, how long? Theme, crucifixion of Jesus. Connect. Okay, we are done here. Did you like it? I liked it. The summary has gone pretty long, so I am not reading points to ponder. These points are important from examination point of view, multiple choice questions point of view. Kindly take your time, read them. I have read a lot. You can read this. Next page, points to ponder. And then all the characters, because a student told me, ma'am, can you just, you know, write in all the characters i have written them at the end so many characters in this play please read their names i have discussed many of them many of them we haven't but then i've covered the entire play nicely don't worry this is hina from team walat take very good care of yourself bye bye